The Reverend Thomas Merton, an important Catholic mystic and spiritual thinker, was born in 1915 to a New Zealand father and an American mother. The many life situations he encountered in his youth led him to explore religion and spirituality and eventually to devote his life to God by becoming a monk and later a deacon at the Abbey of Gethsemane, a part of the Order of Trappists in Kentucky, USA. He also enjoyed living alone in a hermitage in the monastery's wilderness area. During his monastic life, Thomas Merton developed his writing talent by translating religious texts and writing biographies. He also started penning poetry, as well as books and articles on topics ranging from spirituality to social justice and peace. One of Merton's most famous statements was, for me, to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. He also said, we are living in a world that is absolutely transparent and God is shining through it all the time. This is not just a nice story or a fable, it is true. Believing in the equality of all religions, Thomas Merton became deeply interested in Eastern traditions in the later years of his life. He also held lively discourses with His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Today, the Thomas Merton Center in Kentucky and the International Thomas Merton Society continue to study the life and works of the wise reverend. We will now continue with the Reverend Thomas Merton's shared wisdom from his book, Thoughts in Solitude. In these chapters, the mystic conveys his perceptions on the sacred act of contemplating on God. If we try to contemplate God without having turned the face of our inner self entirely in his direction, we will end up inevitably by contemplating ourselves, and we will perhaps plunge into the abyss of warm darkness, which is our own sensible nature. That is not a darkness in which one can safely remain passive. On the other hand, if we depend too much on our imagination and emotions, we will not turn ourselves to God, but will plunge into a riot of images and fabricate for ourselves our own homemade religious experience. And this too is perilous. The turning of our whole self to God can be achieved only by deep and sincere and simple faith, enlivened by a hope which knows that contact with God is possible and love which desires above all things to do His will. Sometimes meditation is nothing but an unsuccessful struggle to turn ourselves to God, to seek His face by faith. Any number of things beyond our control may make it morally impossible for one to meditate effectively. In that case, faith and goodwill are sufficient. If one has made a really sincere and honest effort to turn himself to God and cannot seem to get his wits together at all, then the attempt will have to count as a meditation. This means that God in his mercy accepts our unsuccessful efforts in the place of a real meditation. Sometimes it happens that this interior helplessness is a sign of real progress in the interior life, for it makes us depend more completely and peacefully on the mercy of God. If we can, by God's grace, turn ourselves entirely to Him and put aside everything else in order to speak with Him and worship Him, this does not mean that we can always imagine Him or feel His presence. 
Neither imagination nor feeling are required for a full conversion of our whole being to God, nor is intense concentration on an idea of God especially desirable. Hard as it is to convey in human language, there is a very real and very recognizable but almost entirely undefinable presence of God in which we confront Him in prayer, knowing Him by whom we are known, aware of Him, who is aware of us, loving Him by whom we know ourselves to be loved. Present to ourselves in the fullness of our own personality, we are present to Him who is infinite in His being. His otherness, His selfhood, it is not a vision face to face but a certain presence of self to self, in which, with the reverent attention of our whole being, we know him in whom all things have their being. The eye which opens to his presence is in the very center of our humility, in the very heart of our freedom, in the very depths of our spiritual nature. Meditation is the opening of this eye. Chapter 11 Nourished by the sacraments and formed by the prayer and teachings of the Church, we need seek nothing but the particular place willed for us by God within the Church. When we find that place, our life and our prayer both at once become extremely simple. Then we discover what the spiritual life really is. It is not a matter of doing one good work rather than another, of living in one place rather than in another, of praying in one way rather than in another. It is not a matter of any special psychological effect in our own soul. It is the silence of our whole being in compunction and adoration before God, in the habitual realization that He is everything and we are nothing, that He is the center to which all things tend and to whom all our actions must be directed, that our life and strength proceed from Him, that both in life and in death we depend entirely on Him, that the whole course of our life is foreknown by him and falls into the plan of his wise and merciful providence, that it is observed to live as though without him, for ourselves by ourselves, that all our plans and spiritual ambitions are useless unless they come from him and end in him, and that in the end the only thing that matters is his glory. We ruin our life of prayer if we are constantly examining our prayer and seeking the fruit of prayer in a peace that is nothing more than a psychological process. The only thing to seek in contemplative prayer is God, and we seek Him successfully when we realize that we cannot find Him unless He shows Himself to us. And yet, at the same time that he would not have inspired us to seek him unless we had already found him. The more we are content with our own poverty, the closer we are to God. For then we accept our poverty in peace, expecting nothing from ourselves and everything from God. Poverty is the door to freedom, not because we remain imprisoned in the anxiety and constraint which poverty of itself implies, but because finding nothing in ourselves that is a source of hope, we know there is nothing in ourselves worth defending. There is nothing special in ourselves to love. We go out of ourselves, therefore, and rest in Him, in whom alone is our hope. There is a stage in the spiritual life in which we find God in ourselves. This presence is a created effect of His love. It is a gift of His to us. It remains in us. All the gifts of God are good, but if we rest in them rather than in Him, they lose their goodness for us. So, 
with this gift also. When the right time comes for us to go on to other things, God withdraws the sense of his presence in order to strengthen our faith. After that, it is useless to seek him through the medium of any psychological effect. Useless to look for any sense of him in our hearts. The time has come when we must go out of ourselves and above ourselves and find him no longer within us, but outside us and above us. This we do first by arid faith, by a hope that burns like hot coals under the ashes of our poverty. We seek him also by humble charity in service of our brothers. Then when God wills, he raises us up to himself in simplicity. What is the use of knowing our weakness if we do not implore God to sustain us with his power? What is the value of recognizing our poverty if we never use it to entreat his mercy? It is bad enough to be complacent in the thought that we have virtue, but worse to rest in careless inertia when we are conscious of our weakness and of our sin. The value of our weakness and of our poverty is that they are the earth in which God sows the seed of desire. And no matter how abandoned we may seem to be, the confident desire to love him in spite of our abject misery is the sign of his presence and the pledge of our salvation. For more information about Thomas Merton, please visit merton.org. Kind viewers, we appreciate your company for today's words of wisdom. 